What is going on, investors? Hopefully, guys are doing well out there. And on today's video, it's actually somewhat of kind of a response to a video that we posted just a couple of days ago. One of the uh, topics on that video was uh, essentially insider selling. So you have executives selling their stock. And I talked about how I didn't mind that that much because that is how executives are compensated. They tend to have, we'll call it, quote, low base salaries. And then to make those millions and millions of dollars, they're awarded shares or equity in the company. And in order to cash out of those millions of dollars, they have to sell the shares. Now, I got some feedbacks from a viewer and uh, I'm, I'm gonna just gonna read what they wrote here and I'm gonna give you some of the pros and cons of this type of investing. So this viewer said, so what if we were to trade and invest based on what I call legal insider trading? In other words, follow the smart money of Wall Street's institutional investors, hedge funds, etc., the likes of Vanguard, BlackRock, Warren Buffett, Citadel Advisors, Millennium Management, Renaissance Technologies, Point72, et cetera. Why not just piggyback on the shoulders of these giants knowing where they are investing their money? So first of all, this is an absolute, this is a great starting point. I'll talk more about it here in a second because everybody has their specialty. In fact, that's a huge red flag to me when I'm looking around Wall Street and looking for people to listen to and get advice from. If they claim they're a crypto expert, they're a healthcare expert, they're also a tech expert. Oh, and by the way, they know everything about oil and gas. That's a huge red flag to me. Everybody finds their lanes. There's the bond king. There are energy guys. There are tech guys. I would consider myself a tech guy. I can tell you everything about software, everything about semiconductors, but guess what I can't tell you anything about? Biotech and healthcare. Just haven't spent a lot of time researching those companies. So one way, if I needed to get a short list of healthcare companies I wanted to invest in, I would go find the best actively managed ETF. So on the ETF's homepage, you can find all the holdings. They'll, you know, typically it's like Pfizer, Eli Lilly, kind of the big names that we all know. But as you scroll through, there's going to be a lot of names that you probably don't recognize. This is a great starting point. Also on these websites, they give you a track record of the manager. So if the manager has been there 10 years, you can see have they actually outperformed not only the healthcare sector, but maybe the S&P 500 over that 10 year period. And so you can get a really good judge if uh, this is a fund and this is a list of stocks that is a good starting point for you. Now, as it relates more closely to what the reader identified, where is as it relates to hedge funds, every hedge fund that is managing $100 million or more actually has to file something called a 13F form. And 13F is just the name that the SEC gives these forms. There's 10Qs, there's 10Ks, there's 8Ks. They all have their own identifying code. 13F is just a filing that any hedge fund or any financial institution that's managing more than $100 million has to file and they have to disclose many, and I say many, but not all of the positions that they are invested in. Now, a couple of things to understand about these 13F filings. First of all, they are 45 days old by the time they are posted. For example, we all know that Q4 of last year ended on December 31st. That would cover the months October, November, and December. But the filing to show what positions you held over those three months for the hedge fund doesn't have to be filed until February 14th. So you actually don't find out until the middle of February what the hedge fund was holding for the last three months of last year. Now, this creates some complications. And if you follow the investment advice of these 13 Fs, sometimes it can lead to maybe not the full story. For example, last year, Warren Buffett made headlines when he bought about $4 billion worth of Taiwan Semiconductor stock. And in fact, it made major news. Everybody was really excited about it, particularly people that were invested or wanted to be invested in Taiwan Semiconductor stock. Now, what was interesting is almost immediately on the subsequent 13F filing, Warren Buffett disclosed that he pretty much sold out of that entire stock. So what that meant is by the time you heard Warren Buffett had bought TSM, he had actually had already bought and then sold it. Now he got spooked by also same video where we talked about China potentially invading Taiwan. Maybe Warren Buffett should check out issues of the bleeding edge since we're not overly concerned about that risk. And look, over the past year, shares of Taiwan Semiconductor outperforming the broader markets. Now, 
Other ways 13F filings can kind of lead you astray, Michael Burry from the famous book, The Big Short. I've got a copy of it back here. It's a great book. I mean, there was a movie as well, but like most movies, the book is far, far better. And it's an easy read written by Michael Lewis. Now, Burry made waves initially on The Big Short by shorting the housing market and predict and kind of correctly predicting that demise. But ever since then, I would say his radar's been off. He's been short the broader equity markets, and that hasn't worked out. And in the second quarter of last year, he started shorting the semiconductor index, uh, represented by an ETF called the SOX. X-O-X-X -X is the ticker symbol on that one. And you can imagine, if you started shorting semiconductor stocks, really at any time over the last year, but particularly in the second quarter of last year, you've lost big time. And over the past year, the SOX ETF is up about 50%. So needless to say, that short position hasn't done well. And if you followed Michael Burry into that position, uh, your account is probably not looking pretty good. Now, probably the biggest downfall, though, of these 13F filings, they actually do not need to disclose short positions. So for a hedge fund, this is actually pretty meaningful because hedge fund, that's like the definition of a hedge fund, right? You're long and short, often the same equity or the same stock or investment. So for example, like a 13F filing could show that a fund is long 100,000 shares of Apple. And you might say, wow, they're they're incredibly bullish on Apple. But what it what doesn't have to disclose in that 13F filing is they're short a million shares of Apple too. And so for a large net short position. So while these 13F filings, they're a good starting point. They give you some good ideas. There are some limitations and it's just something that you need to keep in mind as an investor. But I, I certainly, when these 13F filings come across, I certainly glance at them. I take a look at the movement. I look at stocks and sectors that these large money managers are moving into and then maybe potentially moving out of and just keeping that in the back of my mind as I'm going through the rest of my investments. Now, one thing that is not talked about a lot is actually lack of institutional ownership in a stock. This shows, so when you see lack of institutional ownership, it actually can show you that once the stock becomes better known, maybe puts up better financial numbers, big money could pile in and drive the shares even higher. Recently on our paid service, Exponential Tech, we recommended, uh, it was like a $2 stock to our pay, again, to our paid service members where the stock actually lacked. I mean, there was very, very little institutional ownership that actually got us excited internally. And, and part of this is because shares of the stock were under $5. And a lot of these hedge funds uh, likely have rules where and a lot of ETFs the same way and even indexes, you can't actively own shares under $5. So we felt once shares pushed over $5, then the institutional money could come in and you could see a stock go from $2 all the way up to 10. But it gave us confidence that the company could really benefit once the institutionals finally caught on. And I got to tell you, across all of our subscription products, we have a few hundred thousand subscribers at Brownstone Research. And this is why, believe it or not, institutionals actually subscribe to our paid research because that many investors can really move the needle. And in many ways, a few hundred thousand active investors can actually move the needle more than large institutions can. So shameless plug, Exponential Tech Investor, Near Future Report, two of our best services at Brownstone Research, which I lead the research on. Hopefully you guys have a wonderful day. I'll be back again Friday. I've got a fun video planned on Friday, kind of off topic, kind of fun, and we'll see how it goes. But until then, enjoy the rest of your week. Bye for now.